talk about family this session. And Mike, uh, Father Mike did a great job talking about the big family of God. We're going to narrow it in because every person in this room shares something in common. We all come from a family. Every single person here, you were born into a family. And every family that we're a part of is unique. And how we love those people and how we exist in that family is a defining part of how we exist in this world. I am a part of a family. I'm the oldest of three, two parents. I'm from Wisconsin. And uh, are you from Wisconsin? Or one person who's like, I'm here. Cheese. Cheese is a thing. Cheese is a thing. So I'm from there. Uh, but I also have a family that I have started. I'm married to Colleen, and I have uh, two kids, one on the way, Elijah, Daniel, Sophia, Grace. And then uh, our third is due August 24th, Micah James. And it's cool. So that's my family. And what's so cool, and one day if, when you get older and you have kids, um, if, you, if you have kids, you'll learn that they are so, they'll, they'll think you're a superhero. And that's one of the coolest parts about being a parent because you are not a superhero. But your kids think you can do anything. There was one point where my son thought I could run faster than a car. He was like, Daddy, you can run faster than a car. And I was like, yeah, I can. Because technically, if the car is going slow enough, I can so I didn't feel bad about that. Like a five mile per hour driver, I can go faster than that car. I like to run races. I do uh, obstacle course racing, so that, uh, Spartan races. They're basically big playgrounds for adults. I love doing that kind of stuff. And it's cool because you're able to bring people along with you into those experiences. So my son and I actually did our first Spartan race together last February. This is a picture of that. It was so cool. He was so tough uh, at the very beginning of his race, which was just an unorganized mess. Uh, like a bunch of kids knocked him over and he hit the ground and like skinned up his knee. And um, when he got done, he didn't notice it at all. It was a mile race with obstacles. And when he got done, his knee was like all beat up and he had no clue. And I was like, man, that's, that's, that looks pretty tough. He's like, yeah, it hurts a lot. And I was like, well, let's go get a Band-Aid for it. He goes, can we get a picture first? <laughs> Like, yeah. Now, this picture, he's got a Band-Aid on, but we've got a picture with his knee. It's all bloody. I didn't show that one because some of you might be squeamish, and I'm not going to do that to you in the middle of the afternoon. But it was gross. There were rocks in it and pus. It was awesome. <laughs> Thanks for painting the picture, man. But I love it. It's fun. It's cool to be a parent, and I get to have these awesome moments with my son. My daughter is so funny and so hilarious, and it just... Last day, on Thursday night at dinner, we were just laughing, and my daughter's telling jokes. She's probably going to be a comedian, sincerely. And I'm like, this is so cool. This is a lot of fun. I had this realization, though, in that experience and thinking about the race with my son, that my kids are getting older, like, rapidly. It's wild how fast time passes. And that I am well aware of my faults and my flaws, but soon they will be, too. I, my son's not always going to think I run faster than a car. And there's a point that we hit in our lives, and I hit it at a certain point. You may have hit it already. We all hit it eventually, where we start to see our parents and our family members, our caretakers, less as like heroes or these supernatural beings. And we start to realize, wow, like, you're human. You're a sinner. You're flawed. You make mistakes just like I do. And for some of us, that realization happens in a very natural and actually healthy way. There's a healthy point that we all hit where we're able to look at our mom and our dad, and our grandparents, our aunts and our uncles, and you kind of start to become a peer where you're like, yeah, like, man, you've had, you make mistakes, but we also start to realize this other thing, like, you have a history and a past. And your parents lived a whole life before you. And you start to see them in, in a new way. And in the best circumstances, that's a really healthy thing. We can't always think that our parents run faster than a car. But we're from unique situations, right? And some people have that realization much, much earlier on 
in our families. We have a moment where we're like, yeah, it's so cool that you think your parents were heroes and your son thinks you can run faster than a car because I think I was four when I realized that my parents were horribly flawed. Some of us come from situations where you're like, it'd be cool if I thought my dad or my mom was a superhero, but I don't know who that person was. Sometimes we have that realization, not in a healthy way and not in a natural way, but a real jarring, difficult way. And some of us have found ourselves in situations in our families where we're like, it's, I'm kind of the head of the household. Like I'm responsible for taking care of my brothers and my sisters. I have to take care of my parents. I kind of have to run things. I'm the superhero. No matter where you go, what you do, who you become, the family that you were born into, even if you don't know them, even if you were born into a family and the life circumstances changed and you have no connection with those people at all, those roots never go away. Your family is something that you will have to reconcile, engage with, interact with, for the rest of your life, in the best circumstances and in the worst circumstances. That's why this session is so critical. As we dive into this relationship that you will never be able to erase, it is literally written into your blood. Your family is written into the very fabric of your DNA. We have to ask ourselves, why is this relationship so important? And how do I navigate it well? with the variety of circumstances we find ourselves in. Let's start with God's intention for the family. This is what the work of theology is. Theology is looking at the world and saying, what is God trying to speak through that? Because if God created all things and God is intentional about all things, then this is intentional too. Why would God create us with a need for a family unit? And the first clue that God was intentional about this is that babies are the most fragile things on the face of the planet. And they stay that way for a long time. A giraffe is born and it begins to walk almost immediately because there are things that will eat it. No doubt there are things that could harm a baby as well, but a human baby takes forever to learn how to walk compared to other animals. Whales are born and they immediately start swimming. Lions are born and very soon after they're learning to hunt. But a human baby can do nothing but eat, sleep, and poop. Poop so much. That's it. No way to communicate except but to cry. No way to learn except by the people around it. So when I see that, I start to think, well, then God had an intentional plan for us to stay together as family units so that we could care for this new life. And again, take a step back and just think about the incredible reality that you are and that a baby is. You had a beginning point. There was a time in your life that you did not exist. My son asked me this question a while ago. He's very existential at almost eight years old. He looks at me and goes, where was I before I was born? That's a good question. And I looked at him like, you were nothing. <laughs> because it's true. Before you were born, you were nothing. And you cannot contemplate that because our fragile human minds cannot contemplate nothingness. But you don't have an end. You go on forever. You're eternal. So you had a starting point, but you don't get an ending point because your soul is eternal. And so when a child is born into a family, Something unique happens in that creation of life. Something was created that was eternal. That's pretty profound. And so God then in his plan designs humans to come together in family units. That in every culture, this is just a reality that people bond together as families to take care of young, to defend one another. It's written into us. But why would God create us that way? Well, the family reveals something about who God is at its very best. God is a relationship within God's self. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, a trinity. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, a very cool document about all of the church's teachings, says that in revealing the fact that God is a trinity, a relationship of three persons, God has revealed his innermost secret. God has shown us something about who God is. 
God the Father loves God the Son for all eternity. And this love begets a third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. There's a creative element of this love, and it's an eternal love. And this love gets reflected in the best situation in a family. At the heart of the best family situation is love. Unconditional love. A love that wills the good of the other. A love that looks at another person and says, I desire that you would get to heaven, that you would have all that you need to develop as a human being, that you know what it is to be loved and to be cared for, and that when you fall and inevitably encounter the suffering of life, this unit, this tribe, will hold you up. And God made it that way. Because the family, in a unique way, reveals something about God. And who God is. But our world is filled with dysfunction because of sin. Father Mike shared a little bit about the progression of sin in the book of Genesis. You have this disobedience Adam and Eve break God's commandment. Instead of choosing freedom, they choose themselves. And in this, suddenly, there becomes blame passing. That's one of the next things that happens. God says, why did you do this? And Adam's like, but the woman told me to. And then the woman's like, the serpent told me to. And then the very next thing that happens is murder. It is a quick escalation, as Father Mike said. And the next thing that happens after that, if you continue it on, is more murder. And after that murder, there's justification. This guy murders somebody else, and he says, I've murdered my brother. And let it be known that anybody who tries to avenge him, there would be a curse upon that person. Things escalate and get out of hand so quickly that by Genesis chapter 6, God regrets creating humanity. And God was grieved. And that's where you get the account of Noah's Ark. Because sin has become so prevalent. But yet in the midst of that, what does God save? Not just a person, a family. God brings Noah's family out of that darkness. Dysfunction in families is a reality out throughout the pages of sacred scripture. There's a man named Abraham, and Abraham and his wife are unable to have a child. And this is hugely problematic for so many reasons. But rather than trusting in God's will, they trust in their own selves. And Abraham has a son with a woman who is not his wife at the bidding of his wife. And then when Sarah, his wife, does have a child, she sends the child that he had first away. A couple generations later, there's a man named Joseph, and he's got several brothers who try to kill him, but then decide that that might not be such a good idea, so they leave him in a well and abandon him. They give him up as a slave. And then they go home and they lie to their father about it. See, the family units in Scripture, they're messy. But then God brings this redemptive element to it, correcting course with the holy family, the family that Jesus is born into. And there's some unique things about this family that I think we're not, because we know that Jesus' family is Mary and Joseph, but it tells us something about the different families we're a part of. Jesus has a biological mother, Mary. I think that's kind of cool to reflect on when you think about Jesus. Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit, but as a child growing in Mary's womb, he shares Mary's blood. That's the human, but Jesus is fully human and fully divine. He has DNA, he has blood, he has a blood type. And it's Mary's. He has a biological mother. But then he has Joseph, who's an extraordinary part of his family, chosen by God to lead God's son. So there's this family that Jesus has that isn't biological, but it's so close and so special and so profoundly integral to Jesus' life. And then Jesus, as the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, is part of a supernatural family. And we have things like that too, right? We have biological family that we're a part of. And maybe you have a deep relationship with those people, brothers, sisters, moms, dads, aunts, uncles, grandmas, grandpas. And then there's extraordinary family that we're a part of. Families that we just, you grow so close with friendships, or you maybe have family friends like this where you're not related by blood, but you're just so close. We have people like that. Aunt Jody and Aunt John are not related to us by blood, but that's what our kids call them because our families are so close. 
We moved to Phoenix, and I don't have really any biological family in Phoenix, but there have been other families we've become so close with, we spend holidays with them. Those are extraordinary family members, and they're important too. And then there's a supernatural family that you and I are a part of, the family of God. Jesus in Matthew chapter 12 is talking to a group of people, and some of his family have showed up. And people come in and they say, Jesus, uh, your mother and your extended family are here. What do you, they're looking for you. And Jesus uses this as a teaching moment because he looks at the group with them. He says, who are my mother and my brothers and my sisters? Anybody who does the will of God, those are my mothers and my brothers and my sisters. He takes the people that he's a part of, his biological family, his mother, his cousins, his extraordinary family, surely members of Joseph's family that are around him. The, the family unit's big in this area. And he extends it and says, we're part of the spiritual family though. And that's important because when you enter into your family situation, I don't know what it looks like. I've got questions from a Q&A that we're gonna walk through in a few minutes, but I know that for some of you, your family life is messy. And when we look at this, there's a couple of things I wanna challenge you with in this workshop as you're looking at your family because all of us are gonna fall on a spectrum here. And so there's not like one stroke advice I can give you for loving your family, but I can tell you this, that you need to. But what that love looks like looks different along the spectrum. You and I cannot get around when we talk about loving our family, one big thing which gets affirmed early on in scripture and later on in scripture, which is the fourth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. It's talked about in the book of Exodus and the book of Deuteronomy was the 10 commandments are related to Moses. And then St. Paul brings it up again later on in one of his letters. He cites that specific commandment. And he actually does a little bit of an explanation on it. He says, this is the only commandment that comes with a promise. And it is, honor thy father and thy mother uh, and you will dwell abundantly in the land. Like you get something when you do it. So it's important. But what does it mean to honor your father and your mother? In the most healthy family relationships, there's still going to be strife. Families are going to mess up. Moms and dads are going to get it wrong. We are going to get it wrong. We're going to need to forgive one another. And so honoring our father and our mother sometimes means forgiveness. They're human. And it also means asking forgiveness. I look back at some of the things I did as a young person that I was so indignant about, that I was so frustrated that my parents would think were wrong. I just didn't understand why they were upset when I came back two hours after curfew after not answering any of their phone calls. Like, dude, take a chill pill, right? Now I think about that, I'm like, what was wrong with you, you punk? I terrible. My mom would be like, we called you for two hours straight. You are two hours late. Where were you? I'm like, oh, I just, my phone. I couldn't hear my phone ringing. It was a phone this big and it didn't have a silent function. <laughs> sometimes we need to ask forgiveness. And sometimes I think we have to recognize as we get older, as you are, that family requires reconciliation and forgiveness. That we seek it and we ask for it. But sometimes we find ourselves in situations where our family isn't healthy, where there's real issues with our moms and our dads. And we're like, it's hard for me to honor my father and my mother when my dad is an alcoholic who never shows up at home and my mom is so distant and disconnected and hurt that she never talks to me. What am I supposed to do to honor them? That's tough. And I think in that situation, it's finding what the healthy boundaries for love are. And one, we can always pray for them, will their good, give them patience where they need it but then also seek out what does it mean to find safe ways to love those people. Ways that don't put ourselves in harm's way or in, in a place where we're, we know we're going to get hurt. How can we forgive those things, but also recognize that there might not be reconciliation? We talk about reconciliation. Think about the sacrament of confession. This is a great example of what reconciliation is. For reconciliation, the whole process to take place, there has to be a relationship that's broken through a fault call that sin, but think about just a normal relationship. I, I do something that damages the relationship. But then the next phase of reconciliation is I have to feel contrite. I need to be actually sorry for that. I'm sorry. I feel terrible that I did that. And then I have to ask forgiveness for that. I'm sorry. I actually say it. And then somebody has to forgive me, and then I make it right. So you see the sacrament of reconciliation here? I commit a sin. It breaks a relationship. 
I realize that I'm wrong. Oh no, I did something wrong. I go to a priest and I say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. This is what I did wrong. I say, I'm acting contrition. I'm sorry. Forgiveness and absolution are offered. And then I get a penance, something to make things spiritually right or to bring some sort of healing or closure spiritually to a situation. This is, I point this out because in your family, sometimes that whole process, it's not gonna happen. Because somebody's not sorry. Because somebody doesn't want to forgive you. But you can always forgive others and you can always ask for forgiveness. That's the part you control. So sometimes you get the whole thing, but sometimes you are just gonna have to say, gosh, my dad was never there. My mom was totally distant. And I forgive them. Even though they didn't say they were sorry. Even though they didn't ask for forgiveness. Because that's about you. I said on Friday night, freedom is on the other side of fear. It's also on the other side of forgiveness. And one of the hardest things you might have to do is forgive somebody who never said they were sorry. But that's for you. Because that bitterness in your heart will destroy you. Who's it hurting to hold on to it? Eventually, that toxin is just about us. Be free. I want you to think about how you embrace humility in your relationships and your family. Forgiveness is a part of how we embrace humility, but Jesus was humble. How do we embrace obedience in humility? In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is away from his family for three days, and the last line of this particular chapter, it's Luke chapter 2, uh, where he is with his family. They find him in the temple, and Jesus goes home with them this is the last line of the chapter, it says, and he was obedient to them. And then we don't hear from Jesus for another, yeah, like 20 years. What's he doing all that time? Being obedient and loving his family. Most of the life of Christ was spent loving just his family. Again, a clear indication that this is something that God has given to us. And that's important. So now, if we're in a challenging family situation, or we're struggling with our family, again, along that spectrum, it's, it could mean a lot of things. We might just be like, gosh, we're in a rough patch. Some things that you can do. One, are to be humble to recognize where I have committed fault. Two, is to be obedient insofar as it, it is still morally acceptable, okay? So like, again, I'll go back to if my dad, my mom is an alcoholic, and they're like, listen, I need you to go, and um, you know, I need you to go grab me beer from downstairs. That might be something like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> really simple example, but, or if they ask you to do something that's illicit or wrong or morally, uh, morally wrong, you don't need to be obedient to that. But you'll find that most of the time in your family, you're not presented with those types of moral situations. Your curfew is not a moral situation. It's just not. The ownership of your cell phone is not a moral situation. Hey, you can't have your cell phone in your room. What? Not a moral situation. Obedience is an important part of being a part of a family. Pray for people, and if you can find time to pray with your family, do that. Be the one who initiates reconciliation by modeling it. Maybe in your family, this is not a thing, like that full process of reconciliation, but you can start to model that. You can be the one who starts to bring that to your mom and your dad. The challenge is that I think we assume the work of family should be easy, but it's not. It's one of the hardest works that you will do. I will say that as a parent, I realize that my wife and I talk about this, I'm like, this is the most exacting, intentional, difficult work uh, that I have ever done because it matters. And like, here's the thing. I, I think I'm a pretty good dad. I'm not good at a lot of things. I'm terrible at basketball. I'm not a particularly good artist. I don't do well with scary movies, especially if there are ghost children in them. <laughs> Not doing it. Four centipedes. But I'm a good dad. That's the thing I want to be the best at. That's my life's work. And I made that decision even though I know that one day, despite all my best efforts, I will fail. That one day my kids, who's so awesome and they're so fun and they're so sassy, will probably look at me as maybe you've done to your mom and dad and say, I hate you. I don't want anything to do with you right now. I'm so mad at you. 
that that will happen. That when they get older, they will make decisions that maybe I agree with and maybe I disagree with. But I will give everything I can to be the best member of my family in the ways that I am able to. As Christians, that's our call in general, to be the best son, the best daughter. But that doesn't mean, that does not mean caving in, giving in, rolling over, or letting our faith just fall apart. It means being a Christian witness. The other thing I want to touch on before we get into questions, you've got some really good questions, is this. If you are in a family situation, I need you to hear me here. If you're in a family situation where you're being hurt, physically hurt, if you're being physically assaulted, you have been physically assaulted, sexually assaulted, if you're in a situation like that, I want you later on today or tomorrow to talk to your youth minister or chaperone about that. Because forgiving in these situations is still important, but in situations like that, there are other things that have to happen to actually bring reconciliation or to bring healing. And you have people with you at your parish that want to walk with you through that. There is nothing you have done, nothing that you could do, nothing that you potentially will do that warrants ever, ever a response that is abusive. There's not. And I need you to hear me on that because I know in those situations, it may be just going through it right now. Well, like, I, I don't know, I deserved it. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Yeah, but like, that's my parent. No, it doesn't matter that it's family. It doesn't matter. So hear me on that because if that's you, after this session, I, I want you to have a conversation so that you can find healing and freedom on the other side of that. That's really important to me and I want you to have that conversation within your group. Now we're going to have a little conversation up here uh, with my friend, Mary Bielski, who all the ladies know. Uh, she's going to come on up and help me with some of these questions you got. Hey, ladies. Hey, yeah, I watched part of your session. Come on. Not all of it, though, because I had to get ready for the guy's session, which was it awesome. It was epic, ladies. Yeah. Gentlemen, it's so nice to meet you, but ladies, I love you. Okay, sorry. I love you. Okay, we had a moment. Thanks for coming up here and talking with me. Yeah. So great. we are part of a family. Um, it, yes and tell, amen. Yeah, yes Can and amen. Can we all just say me? families are tough? Yeah. They're the most, I just want to say I'm the youngest of five kids. And um, so anyone have big families here? Come on. I love it. I love it because there's crazy personalities. Like celebrations are amazing and stressful and all the in-between. But um, I think that in my family, it's like the best of all moments and the hardest of all moments. Yeah. Right? It's just, it is. and I think either if, even if you're an only child or you have two siblings or a big family, I think it's a place that God really challenges us to love. Yeah, it is. Now, we got a few questions. Okay, I'm going to lump no. some of these questions together because we got a lot of the similar ones, but this is a great one. Um, we got a, several questions about just what to do in situations where the family religions are mixed. And so this is, and some of you are in this situation where maybe dad is non-denominational, mom's non-denominational, one of your parents is Catholic, one is not. Maybe brothers and sisters have fallen away from the faith or changed faiths. And I think even in those extraordinary families, we might have close family friends we have where they're of a different religious belief. How, how do we show them and invite them into our faith and kind of witness to them? Um, especially on topics that maybe are more like rooted in our religious beliefs. I mean, as you kind of think about that, what are, what are your thoughts? How do, we, how do we navigate those interfaith relationships in our families? Well, I think the first challenge is for us to know our own faith. And so for me, I think the, the, the call for me is to love Jesus and to know him and to know what I really believe. The best part about having a family that might believe different things is it really challenges you to look at what do you believe and what do you think. And I think the bottom line is right now we're living in a culture, it's not even in our families, but walking down the streets, my best friends have different faith backgrounds than I do. And how do I have those hard conversations? But I think the for, first and foremost is finding where we have commonality, mm -hmm. especially as believers. Like if you have, I know one of the questions was a family member who's a Protestant versus a Catholic. I work with, I, I, what I do in all my relationships is I try to find the commonality because there's usually more things that we agree with than we don't. And in the places that we don't, I usually ask questions on why you think that is. And so coming in with humility and not trying to win and force, but coming in with love, you know, love is the most powerful tool. Paul talks about this, that love wins. You want to win? Love. And sometimes it's not about being right, but it's choosing love and finding conversations and then coming back to those conversations over and over, even if you don't know how to yeah, that's really good. I think the only thing I'd add is to recognize that in these relationships, it's like a long-term 
process. I love that. I like love wins and love is a long-term process. So sometimes in these conversations, we go, I got to win right now. Like right. what's, what's the right word to say? And it's, it's not that. I love getting curious and asking questions. Um, I think that's the best way to navigate, finding common ground too. And if they're not religious, go to values. That's what I found to be helpful because obviously with non-denominational Protestant Christians, hey, Jesus, commonality. But with other things like, hey, I'm an atheist. Okay, well, tell me what you value as an atheist, as right. my atheist brother, or uncle, whatever, what do you value? And then go there because you'll find a lot of your values align between right. these two things. And then you can have a conversation, right. um, which is absolutely key. And I want to share, I'm just going to keep talking. Um, I also think that um, it's really important that we share through witness. Um, it's the most powerful tool because no one can question your own experience. And so sometimes we get into these intellectual debates, and I just bring it back to the, the, the home base of love and Jesus and relationship, because no one can challenge that in the end. So yeah. anyway, next That's question. Great. Well, we are, got a few questions about this. Um, how do you deal with addiction within the family? Um, and that could be anything. Maybe we have brothers or sisters, mom, dad, extended family members who wrestle with an addiction, and that can be a profoundly taxing and difficult on us. Um, and I kind of want to just toss out here First and foremost, if you're in a situation where somebody is wrestling with an addiction, there are a couple of things that you should do for yourself first, um, because you're probably like, I want to jump in. How do I help them? And the first is to find a support system. Um, that might be a therapist or a counselor, um, somebody who can walk that walk through that with you and to process the emotions you're feeling and the places you're struggling to make sure that you are staying healthy in that, those circumstances. Um, the second thing is to look for other support groups. There are different groups of people that um, children of alcoholics is a one particular group. Again, places where you can be supported and have people who are walking with you uh, in this. The third thing is, and I'll go back to what I ended our talk with, is if this addiction is producing some sort of abuse, speak to your youth minister or chaperone about that and how to navigate that situation. And the fourth thing I would throw out is just to lean back into that spiritual family of God that you might not be finding some of the support you need at home, but perhaps there's something you could find in that spiritual community and that spiritual family. What are your thoughts on this, Mary? Well, I, I think that he's very wise. So well, well said. I would just add just a little bit more spiritual c component because I think um, I want to like take off my shoes and get passionate about this. I, I work in life coaching and I work with a lot of people that have issues within their family, whether it's addiction, parents who are depressed, and we're going to have a lot of questions of how do we deal with parents y'all your parents are older than you and they're supposed to have it figured out they're supposed to have they're supposed to be the caretakers of your heart and what's so hard is oftentimes our own parents are the very places where there's woundedness pain and addiction and what we're all talking about is how do you respond to that and I want to call you to say you want to change your family you have to begin in prayer I am telling you that there is a power in prayer to walk into your house, in your prayer room, and you call down angels in your room. I'm telling you, there is authority in the name of Jesus. You pray in your heart to love. You ask for wisdom that surpasses all understanding. It says in James, when we ask God for wisdom, he'll give us wisdom. Because sometimes I don't know the answer, but I know a God that does. And when we have hard situations, sometimes we feel so powerless but there's a God that actually wants to enter into your relationship. The other dynamic is number two is oftentimes because our parents are older and the authority, it's hard as an adolescent to be that place of authority. So you have to find older people that you can, men that you can lean into for mentorship. I work with a teenager, um, she's actually 19 and I'll end with this, who has a mom who is an alcoholic and I've been life coaching her for a while. And the first time we, life we did coaching session, she said to me, um, I, wanna, I wanna reclaim my story. And I was like, story? She said, um, like, tell me. I'm like, that's fascinating, right? I'm like, tell me more. And she was 20 years old. And I, and I said, what does that mean? And she said, I, I'm so tired of my relationship with my mom being the centerpiece of my brokenness. And I think that the reality of what we had to work through is how do you love your mom, right? How do you help your mom? But also knowing in the end, like, you can't fix your parents. It's Jesus. And so there's prayer, it's looking for outlets, but there will be a time that I promise you, if you stay in prayer and you ask for God for ways, he will move and open doors, but you have to look for resources. And then first and foremost is prayer. And as he said, counseling and relationships. Yeah. So just add to that. That's great. Uh, there's one question on here that I think might resonate with a lot of folks here. And I'm going to summarize it because it's a little bit longer. Um, but the, the kind of crux of it is that um, my parents are arguing a lot about me. And uh, like, I'm kind of the center of their arguments and I, they, they kind of want me to be perfect, but how do I, how do I bring reconciliation into that um, when I seem to be the thing that's causing 
some of these challenges, um, especially if, if it's kind of hard to talk to to my parents. I think there's a lot there yeah, to like, unpack. I have to get the details. I'm like, sit down, let's talk. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think so in sort of in a general sense, I mean, what do we do? And again, like, let's, you know that at different moments in life sometimes, I, again, I'm thinking back to one, like, teenage experiences I have now looking back in hindsight, I'm like, ooh, yeah, that was stressful. Like, I put some stress on, on people there. Um, and so we have those moments. It's part of, spoiler alert, that's part of growing up. Like, you're going to do things and put stress on your family and make mistakes, and, and that happens. How do we navigate this situation where it seems like I'm a source of tension right. in my family, and that's causing the tension? I have some thoughts. What, what do you think? Well, my first thought, and I don't know what you would say, is I would actually, if I was working with someone like that, I would really want to know what's the, what's the argument and where's the truth. Mm. So if you are a cause to some of the issues, there's some questions, right? They're, they both, your parents could be crazy, and there's nothing, you're not, you're not but what I, you can only control what, what you have control over, right? You can't control your parents, but what am I doing that's adding or not adding? What am I not communicating? And how am I participating in the cycle? Here's the deal that I do in coaching is that there's a cycle. Even if you're with someone who's unhealthy, like if you're dating someone who's super unhealthy, everyone's like, well, he's really unhealthy and I can't handle it. Well, if you're in a relationship with them, then you're responding to their unhealthy behavior. So whatever dynamic's happening, the first person I would look at is yourself. What am I doing? How am I participating? Am I loving? Am I showing up? And if you, most likely if there's an argument, then the second part is how are they responding to that? Mm. Um, and, the, and for me, the, the, this is more of a human answer, is we have to learn how to communicate. And I think the biggest thing, we probably could do eight hours on this, is one of the issues in our families is that we don't have real conversations. Can we get an amen? Amen. Can we get a real amen? amen. Because it's crazy that there's like the right elephant in the room. Parents are fighting, and then I'm like, have you talked to your parents about it? And they're like, nope, right? So learning to have hard conversations, and most of us live behind a phone. We actually, we, we text, we don't actually know how to have like real conversations to get to the heart of the matter. And so what we're talking about is that there's one, you can only deal with yourself, and then if there's issues between your parents, I would actually have a conversation with one of them to see what's going on and how you're partic participating to solve that. Yeah, I think in kind of being real about the situation too, as you look at it, and if you have siblings, you could ask them and bring them into it. If your parents are constantly arguing, you're like, oh, like it always feels like it's about me, I would be willing to put forward to you that there might be some other things there. And I think sometimes we internalize that, like, oh, I'm the cause, I'm the reason. And this happens in divorce sometimes, right? Like, if right. you're from a divorce family, you may have experienced this or maybe experiencing this now where you're like, hey, I'm the reason. Like, it was, it was me, it was my fault. Um, is to step back and to say, well, wait a second, there's other things going on. You know, again, your mom and your dad have lives that they lead. And there may be other issues at play or at hand. And so I would encourage you to step back and, and really be cautious about how you internalize that. Ask about our own behaviors. And then if you're like, man, I don't know that I'm doing anything that's outside of the realm of minor infractions that maybe I could clean up. But uh, they're still fighting and arguing. And I just feel like I can never be perfect enough. There may be something going on that's bigger than you. Right. And then and a great, this is my psychology background, a great statement that you could say if you learn to say this is when you do this, it makes me feel this way. So one of the things I used to learn, and um, I used to do sales, and they used to tell us to sell to the no. What I mean by that is your biggest fear, sometimes we don't say it in the room, so sometimes what I would say to my, my sibling is my greatest fear is that you, you don't respect me. because Whatever your fear is, my greatest fear is if I tell you the truth, you're really not going to listen. Whatever your fear is, sometimes if you, if you wait for the time and the moment, you can't do it when they're watching TV or when they're stressed out. You ask for wisdom. But if you can have a conversation to, to, to either name the fear or the other thing to do, so that's one area I say, my biggest fear is that if I tell you how I feel, you're going to get upset. Like, what if you ask the question, what do I do if my dad just flips out all the time? Well, wait till a moment that he's not in that zone and say, you know, one of my biggest fears is if I really tell you what's going on, dad, you're going to flip out. And just pause. Because what you'll find is that people will respond if you can get them in the right moment and just get to the honest truth. The second phrase that I often use, just put this in your pocket, is when you do this, if I feel this way. So if your parents are fighting, you say, when you guys fight and you're only talking about me, it makes me feel like it's my fault. So you're bringing this issue and you're bringing it to the, up to the, the center part of the conversation. And hopefully you both have the maturity to actually walk through that. Mm, that's good. There's a couple questions actually I'm going to link together. Go. Um, but I'm going to split them up in a particular way. Here's the first one. How do I distance myself from toxic family members? 
And I think there's a couple layers of challenges on that, isn't there? Yeah. Um, especially if you are living at home with a toxic family member. Yeah. Like, how do you kind of navigate that? You've been so insightful. I'm going to kick this one to you <laughs> again. And then I'll, I'll follow Hide up. Hide in you your closet such good things to say, and pray for I'll... them to go. I'm kidding. Don't listen to me. That's not true. Um, you know, that's hard. I think that I have a, a lovely siblings, but I have some siblings that talk in a way that aren't toxic, but they just talk in a way that isn't my preference in terms of like being nasty or saying things that are inappropriate. And um, whatever that is, uh, I, I think that the best way to do boundaries is, is three ways. One is time, right? Space and conversations. So I limit, for instance, if I'm going to be in a situation where I know that um, like, you know that with your family, you're going to have to spend time with them. Amen? Amen. You're not going to be able to be like, I will not see my cousin because they make, you, you can't do that. So, but you can limit your time with them, right? You can say, I'm only going to spend 15 minutes or I'm going to, it's like what I do with dating, right? If you're dating someone that, or like you, you need to get out of a situation, you have your girlfriend that you can call and be like, I need out, right? So always have a way that you can like shift time, amount of time, the depth of that conversation, Right. Um, and also having a couple of phrases that if there's a behavior that you don't like, you have freedom, check this out, Christians, to actually say, no, I don't appreciate when you talk like that. And you can actually engage in setting appropriate boundaries in small and big ways. Yeah, that's really insightful. I think, too, as you gauge those relationships, because uh, there are tiers or kind of a expanding circles of our family relationships, and sort of to assess, like, where does that person fall in my sphere of necessity of interaction? So if the toxic person is like, it's my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, I live with them. I think it's sort of asking, well, what are the, what's at the roots of that toxic behavior? And again, having open communication and conversations. Hey, I feel like this is not a good thing. And then maybe putting up boundaries if, if we have to like, yeah, my, this, this behavior at home it's toxic. It's not one of those things that's abusive. We talked about that, but it's just a toxic. It's not, it doesn't make me feel good. I don't like that. We're being brought into it. Set up boundaries, have particular times to interact. I found too that sometimes structure is good in those relationships where if it's a, a relationship of necessity, I know that when we're doing this thing, that relationship becomes less toxic. It's like there's a neutralizing agent. When we're playing a board game, that's not a toxic thing, unless it's monopoly, which immediately makes every relationship toxic. But like, oh, that neutralizes it. Or if we're out to eat, or if we're going for a walk, or if we're playing, you know, doing something, sometimes that helps. Learn what those things are. As you get older, or you have relationships further out, you may get to a point where you say, I love you, I'm gonna pray for you, but I'm gonna choose not necessarily to interact. So I have extended family who are, are toxic people that I'm like, I love you, I pray for you, but I don't put myself in situations to interact with them because despite attempts at reconciliation or forgiveness, it's like, maybe this just isn't, right. isn't going to work. Um, along those lines, if there's a question about how do we sort of work to mend relationships. So uh, situations, a couple that, uh, that have come up like, hey, we had the conversation, the tough conversation a year ago, two years ago, six months ago, and uh, we reconciled. Forgiveness happened. But now we're in the point of mending the relationship and it just feels like it's taking some time Let's start with that as part A. How do I deal with that? Like, in, in, we were forgiven, but now how do we move forward? Because it still feels awkward. Right. Well, um, I actually think, to be honest, I, I think the forgiveness piece is probably the hardest. And you, you did a great job talking about that. I think that's the number one issue that I see within families is that when I do coaching, I say we have to do our own work. And I think we say we forgive, but oftentimes the resentment or those frustrations. And I think the one thing that's really helped me is I allow the people in my life to be who they are. And this is kind of hard because we're like, don't, aren't we responsible for everyone else? Shouldn't we? Meaning, I have some people in my family that um, that I love and I've forgiven, but it's it just takes time to walk in relationship with them. Um, and so, what does that look like? I think communication in terms of saying like, um, one of the things I have had to do with my sister, like I love, I have one sister who passed away, and then another sister who we are um, really close, but we're very different, very very different. And we see the world different. And we see our family different. Anyone else like that? You, like, you have one view of mom and dad, and they have a different view, and there's, co there's conflict. And so working through that dynamic with her, like learning to love her and walk through that. And I, I've, we've had many tearful conversations where I've had to say, like, this hurts, or I disagree with this. Um, and one of the things that I did this last year is I, which was very riskful, I invited her to a conference that I was going to. And I um, just was with her. And I even said to her, you know, sometimes I don't know how to respond when this happens. 
I don't know how to love you. And I want us to have a better relationship. And I think one thing that you have to do is actually tell the other person what you desire. I want us to be closer. Because sometimes people don't know that. I want us to have meaningful conversations. Like some of you have parents that you don't have depth. Like they're just busy. Maybe just telling them, hey, mom, sometimes I want you to ask me about these deeper things and I don't know how. Sometimes you have to tell people what you need. And we assume that just like in dating, when you're dating a guy or girl, like, you're, like they can't read your mind and your parents are so out here that they don't oftentimes know how to love you. So when I, do, I was thinking when I date someone, you can tell I'm single, but I often tell someone how to love me. Like, I need you to affirm me. I want more time with you. So not be afraid to say, I want, like some things I do with my siblings is I want a better relationship with you. And sometimes I don't know how. Or, hey, if my sister's ignoring me, be like, hey, sister, I want to, like, she's, like, blowing me off. I'm like, hello, I'm your sister. I want to have time with you. Like, making those kind of jokes to, to kind of ask and, and get to the place of what you need. I hope that's helpful. That is, yeah. And I think one thing I'll, I'll tack on to that, because as I'm listening to you talk, I'm like, what's going through my head might be going through some of your heads as well, which is, I know what's going to happen if I have that conversation. I know what they're going to say. I was reading uh, an article recently that was talking about some research that was done about uh, our ability or our ability we think we have to read other people's minds. And mind reading isn't like, I know what you're thinking, but it's, it's exactly what, you, what we described here is like, I, I can't say that because I know if I say that, they're gonna, see, they're gonna say this. That's mind reading. And what the study found is that we are very bad at that. We are very bad at judging what people's responses right. will be. Now, there are some things that we can establish patterns of behavior where we're like, I know that this is a pattern of behavior. But there, if you haven't established that, really ask yourself, is that an established pattern of behavior or response? Or am I just making up that story and trying to mind read? Because right. that's what often prevents us from having that open communication, right? Like, I don't want to tell you my needs because you're just going to shut it down. But right. do you actually know that? Right, but you could not. also even say that. I know I'm getting, but like, that's the thing. If you know they're sarcastic, if you like somebody in your family is always sarcastic, just say, I'm afraid if I tell you this, you're just going to be use a little sarcasm or, or you're just going to shut me down. So you can actually use communication to bring that to the surface. And then they might blow you off again and you know, but I think you're right. Like, don't assume, just have a conversation. And this is the other, and I, don't, I know we're out of time, but the other statement that I say is love pushes past the awkward. Mm. Y'all listen to me. If you want to live the Christian life, if you want to live fearlessly, it's going to be scary to have hard conversations with people that you love. There's going to be times that you're going to, and Martin Luther King once said in the end, we will not remember the words of our enemy, but the silence of our friends. And we have to be courageous to have hard conversations when the Lord invites you to them. I'm not saying every minute you go and bear your soul, but love pushes through awkwardness. And learning to be awkward and uncomfortable and doing it afraid, even in your family, is probably the most powerful way that you can learn to love. And even when you mess up, you learn and you grow. But I am telling you from someone who has had issues in my own family, my, I'm getting all passionate, with my siblings and family members, I've seen weeping, I've seen hard issues, but I've seen the glory of God heal the home. And it's possible. And I actually believe that most of you are going to be the ones, the catalysts that actually bring healing to your parents. I'm surprised it took you that long to get out of your seat. I know, seat, I know. I was like so. sitting down. I'm like trying to be all I'm, like I'm wise. I'm oh, I'm wisdom. Listen, just kidding. Okay, you, you had a lot of great questions. We weren't able to get to them all, but here's what I want you to do. You have wonderful people who are just like Mary and I and Pete and Father Mike. I thought you said we're wonderful. That was yeah, nice. Yeah, we well, are wonderful people. I, good self-talk, right? That's right. Uh, your youth minister, chaperones, priests are with you. Ask them these questions too. If you didn't get your question answered, ask Ask them, how do I do this? What does this look like? Have those conversations with the people you came with. And let's close our session in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.